as a new front line in the war against organized crime. In southern Italy's rugged highlands, a previously unknown criminal group meets. It's just about here that some of the top bosses were standing, having their secret meeting. Called the Andrangheta, its bosses are Europe's biggest cocaine traffickers. The police are fighting back, forcing mafiosi underground into bizarre and sophisticated bunkers. Holy moly. From here, they run their criminal empires, protected by a wall of silence. They dug up the whole street to bury their bunkers. And nobody breathed a word. This is the story of a little-known mafia whose secret inner workings are only now coming to light. This is Calabria, a beautiful and blighted region at the very tip of Italy's boot. As a historian, I've spent years studying Italian organized crime. Now, I've come to this mountainous peninsula, a stone's throw from the island of Sicily, to investigate Italy's most mysterious and powerful mafia, the Endrangheta. Cacciatori, the hunters, are an elite law enforcement unit. They've agreed to take me deep into Andrangheta territory. In realtà, la Locride, sì, possiamo considerarlo un territorio nemico eh, perché ha rappresentato per anni roccaforte dell'Andrangheta. Il consenso era per la quasi totalità rivolto alla criminalità organizzata. Lieutenant Angelo Zizi and his men often have to operate under the cover of darkness. La caratteristica del nostro lavoro è appunto quello di una infiltrazione occulta, eh, osservazione ed esfiltrazione sempre in maniera occulta. After two and a half hours, we reach a small village high up in the mountains. It's four in the morning. With the mist on the mountains here and the silence, there's something really spooky about this place. Now abandoned, this house was once used as a base by Calabrian criminals. Tenente, che cos'è questo punta d'accesso? È un complicato meccanismo di carrucole azionato attraverso un sistema elettrico. Fondamentalmente è una parte di muro che scorre sul pavimento col bunker chiuso all'esterno è praticamente impossibile individuare l'accesso. Geniale. There's something fiendishly clever about this mechanism, that kind of James Bond villain fashion. The concealed entrance leads to a narrow passage. Pretty tight in here. This secret hideout was discovered almost by chance when the team were pursuing a group of Andrangheta gangsters. Muro, sono piantati dei chiodi, quindi state attenti, mantenetevi al centro. When Zizi and his team first entered, there was no sign of the men they were after. Quando abbiamo scoperto quella parte, quella botola, quell'apertura uh, sotto il pavimento, eravamo convinti di trovare eh, lì dentro il latitante. 
In realtà non abbiamo trovato nessuno. Per quale motivo? Perché quest'altra apertura all'interno del muro era chiusa e occultata molto molto bene. Cioè un sistema di scatole cinesi praticamente. Esattamente. What they'd stumbled upon was not just one concealed bunker. It was a whole warren of underground passageways, false walls and secret rooms. Dall'interno del bunker siamo passati all'interno di una vera e propria rete di cunicoli che porta in direzioni differenti. Una all'interno delle fogne, in un'altra direzione, attraverso un tunnel di circa 30 metri, arriviamo in due abitazioni differenti e nella quarta direzione andiamo all'interno di un'altra un abitazione. The tunnels fan out under the village, linking hideouts and escape routes. So the tunnel system was a kind of map of the Andrangheta network in this village. It's a claustrophobic maze, completely disorientating. This is a completely different house. It's a completely different house. Another secret entrance under the stairs and we're into a completely new house. Absolutely amazing. By the time I got out, dawn had broken. We came in somewhere over there. But when the Cacciatori got into the first part of this system, there were six people in there. The Cacciatori had surrounded the whole area, and there was a chase through this bunker system with its different exits, each Cacciatori having to follow a different Indranghetista as he made his escape. Three of the Indranghetisti got away, and having been through that system of tunnels, I can really see why. Building this subterranean labyrinth was a major enterprise. Somebody must have noticed all the work going on, but not a soul told the authorities. For more than a century, the men of the Andrangheta have been the undisputed authority in these mountain villages. To understand the nature of their dominance, you need to understand the geography of Calabria. And that means taking to the air. very exciting for two reasons. One, because I've never been in a helicopter before. And two, because now we're going to see some of the wildest parts of Calabria from the air. We took off from the city of Reggio Calabria, one of the mafia power bases on the coast. But the heart of Andrangheta territory is Aspromonte, the harsh mountain. Aspromonte is inaccessible. The law has never had much of a foothold here. The Indrangheta is a secret society of criminals, and for a long time these remote mountain settlements have been its fortresses. In the 1970s and 80s, the Indrangheta took to kidnapping for ransom, using these remote mountains to hide the captives often for years. Each of these villages is controlled by a different clan. If you know where to look, it's not hard to see who's in charge. We're about to fly over a villa that an Andragida boss had built for himself. And he wanted to, to look exactly like Tony Montana's villa in Scarface, the movie. I suppose all gangsters are gangster wannabes at heart. Today, the main source of the Andrangheta's wealth and power lies 20 minutes flight northwest at the port of Gioia Tauro. 
opened in the 1990s, Joya Taro is now the biggest container port in the Mediterranean. It should have been good news for this underdeveloped region. È passata a 3 milioni, a oltre 3 milioni di container annuali. Su questi c'è una tassa di sicurezza che è imposto la Francia. Di un dollaro e mezzo ogni container. Siamo intorno ai 4 milioni di euro solo come pizza. For the Andrangheta, the port of Gioia Dauro is the head that laid the golden egg. Extorting a protection payment on every container is just the start. The main illegal business here is smuggling. Ordinary commercial routes are used as Trojan horses. From bananas to frozen prawns, from iron to hazelnuts. Any cargo shipped from South America to Europe and the port of Gioia Tauro can be used as cover for Andrangheta's cocaine. Thousands of containers pass through the port every day. It's impossible to check and scan more than a handful of them. The best chance of catching a cocaine shipment is through intelligence on the ground. But even there, the criminals are often one step ahead. The Andrangheta plant their own men in the port, just like we watch them, they watch us. The sheer scale of this place is awe-inspiring. The ships are like tower blocks. The piles of containers go on for kilometers. And if you think that a big load of cocaine is about the size of a wardrobe, makes it very clear that the old cliché about looking for a needle in a haystack just doesn't come close. It's estimated that no more than 20% of the cocaine coming through the port is intercepted by the authorities. But even that amounts to an impressive haul. All'interno di questa cassaforte abbiamo parte della cocaina sottoposta a sequestro il 6 ottobre 2011 costituita da una partita di ben 520 kg di cocaina, purissima direttamente proveniente dal Sud America. Era stata ritirata all'interno di un container e il soggetto arrestato era eh, in, stato colto in flagranza di reato mentre tentava di trasportare all'esterno dell'area portuale questa partita di cocaina. Questo è circa un chilo di cocaina. Come questo quanto vale? Se lo vendiamo così puro sono circa 120.000 euro. Se lo vendiamo tagliato tre o quattro volte, quindi moltiplichiamo 100.000 euro per due, tre o quattro volte. 100.000 euro just for that, just for that, and look at it, this is a whole wardrobe full of the stuff. Eh, la partita complessiva ha un valore di circa 135 milioni di euro se fosse giunta al mercato finale. Quindi noi abbiamo tolto dal mercato finale 135 milioni di euro di introiti all'andrangheta. And that's not all. Come potete vedere wow. in questa stanza eh, non abbiamo più la disponibilità di eh, armadi blindati per. Scusami, sento un odore strano. L'odore acre degli acidi utilizzati per la produzione della cocaina. Mm, okay. Three tons of pure cocaine have been seized here in the last two years. And of course this is only a tiny part of the total amount of cocaine that's flooding through the port of Gioia Tauro. This is quite extraordinary. The Calabrian Mafia, the Andrangheta, is today the biggest cocaine trafficking syndicate in Europe. The trade is global, but some of the profits end up close to home. Overlooking the port is the town of Rosano, home to one of the Andrangheta's most ruthless cells, the Pesce clan. Pesce sono una cosca che ormai esiste, operativa, padrona del territorio da almeno 60 anni. Carabinieri special agent Giuseppe Lumia knows more about the Pesce clan than anyone. 
invece hanno il controllo della quasi totalità delle attività della vita globale di Rosarno. Da decenni vivono questo territorio spremendo tutte le risorse che riescono. As well as cocaine trafficking, the Pesce clan grew rich from extortion and fraud. In this small rundown town, the clan members enjoyed the good life, non more so than their chief, Ciccio Pesce. Quella è la casa di Ciccio Pesce, la villa di Ciccio Pesce, costruita dal padre, proprio lì, bella, ricca, grande, sfarzosa, in mezzo a tanta povertà, perché tutti potessero vederla e perché loro, dall'alto di quella collinetta, potessero dominare l'intera Rosarno. È una vera fortezza con mura perimetrali alte più di tre metri, completamente circondata da telecamere. È impossibile avvicinarsi lì senza essere visti. The house occupies a position like a baron's castle in the old days. At 30 years of age, Ciccio Pesce became the youngest known boss of an Indrangheta clan. His swift rise to power was witnessed by a man who has since become one of the very few Calabrian mafiosi to turn state witness. For security reasons, we can't reveal his identity. We'll call him Tony. What kind of man is Ciccio Pesce? I've known him since he was a child, Ciccio Pesce. When he was 14 or 15, on New Year's Eve, he went around town with his friends with some Kalashnikovs. He sprayed the streets and the shop shutters with bullets. There was no particular reason to do so. He just wanted to make a mess because power was growing in his hands. Extreme violence was the basis of Ciccio Pesce's power. People respected him out of fear. They were scared of rebellion because he'd become the absolute ruler of our area. As one of the poorest regions in Europe, Calabria receives huge subsidies from the European Union for public construction works and farming. Mobsters like Ciccio Pesce have stolen much of that money. Tony helped Pesce make millions through a colossal scam involving oranges. The oranges had to be delivered to a plant, but we wouldn't take anything there. We would take the paperwork the night before, however, and in the morning it would be signed by corrupt officials saying the oranges had been delivered. After 90 days, we would receive the funds for the oranges from the European Union. And how much did you make in an average year? I was small fry, but in a good year I could make three, four hundred thousand euros from oranges. And a boss like Ciccio Pesce, how much would he make? Someone like Ciccio Pesce, who owned the farms, the plants, the transport companies, everything. He'd make, out of the oranges scam alone, some five to six million euros a year. The clan would invest the money in drugs and weapons, and they would double it, even treble it. The Indrangheta is highly territorial. When they fall foul of the law, bosses like Ciccio Pesce very rarely take flight. Instead, they go to ground, close to home. The man of honor, the leader, never leaves his own turf. For them, a bunker is an investment. If someone needs to lay low for a while, hoping the police will lose interest in them. Many of these bunkers were made of old shipping containers, sunk into the soil of the orange groves, and kitted out with everything a boss would need to lie low. Of course, a bunker is only safe if its location is kept secret. In Calabria, where the Indrangheta is more feared than the law, the blanket of silence known as Omerta is as thick as anywhere in Italy. So it's not surprising that not many people have broken the regime of Omerta. 
I'm on the way now to find out what happens when you do. I've been given an address some 10 miles south of Rosano. It looks like my arrival is being closely monitored. This fortified compound is where construction entrepreneur Gaetano Safiotti lives and works. It's the only place Safiotti would agree to meet. Ciao, molto molto contento di conoscerti. Eh? Quindi questo è l'ufficio. Vengo da zero. Adesso sono 32 anni di attività, quindi sono già parecchi. Safiotti's company grew from nothing into a multi-million pound business until in 2002 the profits crashed. Ecco, questo è il fatto, c'è un'azienda sempre in positivo dal 1981 quando è nata. Poi l'anno degli arresti è crollato. For years, like most businesses in the area, Safiotti had paid regular extortion money to the Andrangheta, but as he became more successful, they wanted more and more control. When he tried to buy a plot of land, the mobsters made their move. And then what happened? One night they set fire to my bulldozer to tell me, you've done something you shouldn't have. Safiotti turned to the state for help, but he soon learned who's really in charge in Calabria. I went to report who'd done it. I was told perhaps it's better you keep that to yourself. You know how these things end up. And my heart sank. And so there is this facade of the state and there is this real state. Paradoxically, the real state is the Andrangheta. The campaign of intimidation escalated. In the middle of the day, they showed up and threatened my staff, including my brother. They gave him a tank of petrol and told him, pour this petrol over the vehicle and set it alight. Safiotti had been pushed to the edge. He decided to fight back. This is a story particular, right? This is the moment in which he takes the money. For months, Safiotti risked his life to capture his tormentors on film as they came for their payoff. On this occasion, several thousand pounds. You see that these are the money that I put here. I go a little bit behind. I take the money in a cassette. Questi sono 10 milioni, vedi qua, li faccio vedere alla telecamera pure, mentre loro sono distratti. Vedi, adesso lui prende i 10 milioni e lei conta quell'altro, vedi, ce l'ha qua. In an unprecedented act, Safiotti took this evidence to a public prosecutor. On the night of January the 25th, 2002, 45 Andrangheta members were arrested. But this was not the end of Safiotti's problems. When someone talks about one's life changing overnight, it may sound exaggerated. But in this case, my world was really turned upside down overnight. My 65 employees must have learnt about the arrest before they came out in the papers, because in the morning, only five showed up for work. Quel giorno stesso tutte le commesse che avevamo ce l'hanno sospese. Le banche anche dove avevo i conti attivi mi hanno chiusi i conti. I conti attivi, non fidi. E fidi ancora peggio. Ma già in sorgimento non potevo prevedere. C'è qualcosa di assolutamente assurdo. C'è immaginato da tutti. Come se tu fossi diventato in quel momento un grosso criminale. Many of Safiotti's friends shunned him. In Calabria, even law-abiding citizens wouldn't risk defying the Andrangheta by being seen with a man like him. This is invece un messaggio della degli amici, no? Cioè quanto prima sul tuo corpo ti arriveranno 45 cocci di pallottoni, così te ne andrai, non di palme, ma di sulla terra. Sarebbe questo il messaggio. 
45 bullets, one for each of the men that Safioti had had arrested. And then the police turned up. They said, we are here for you because from now on you are under protection. That was it. The beginning. The situation in Calabria can seem incomprehensible at first glance. But to really understand what's going on there, we need to take a step back, or rather take a trip across the Straits to Sicily. This beautiful island has long been home to the notorious Cosa Nostra. For the last 30 years, the Italian state has been struggling to contain the most powerful criminal organization in modern history. Coming to Palermo today, you have to make an effort to remember that 25 years ago, this was a city in the grip of terror. The bloodiest mafia war in history was going on. Hundreds of people were being killed, bodies were being left burning in the street or taken out to the sea and dumped. Cosa Nostra was killing magistrates, policemen, journalists, politicians. That violence reached its savage climax with the 1992 bombing assassinations of anti-mafia judges Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino. Cosa Nostra had declared war on the state and seemed to be winning. It felt like the country was on its knees. If they were able to blow up a motorway and kill magistrates under the highest level of protection and also kill our police colleagues escorting them. And I felt this was an extremely powerful and terrifying organization which would stop at nothing. It's been a long, hard road for the state to win back credibility. A key success came in 2006 when, after 43 years on the run, Cosa Nostra's boss of bosses was finally arrested. The uncatchable had been caught. In that moment, the people felt a burst of courage. They wanted to show it by coming to our Palermo headquarters to express solidarity with us. And the belief that this battle could be won. If organized crime is to be defeated, ordinary people need to be empowered to resist. They have to believe that police and judges are not in the pay of the mobsters and that those who stand up to the Mafia will be protected. Now, in Sicily, that is beginning to happen. We promote a sort of a rebellion, a cultural revolution against Eduardo the Mafia. Eduardo Zafuto is one of the founders of a grassroots anti-Mafia group. Adio Pizzo, or Farewell Extortion, encourages ordinary Sicilians to come out and defy the Mafia. Cosa Nostra works like a shadow state, using extortion as its tax. Sometimes here the Mafia asks just 10, 15 euros per month, that's a nominal payment. It's important for the Mafia that even the fish shop as well as the vegetable shop pay, accept to pay protection. Yeah. So how many people do you think actually pay protection money in this market, for example? 80% of... 80%? Uh, yes. Just around the corner from the market is a shop selling traditional Sicilian caps. When we started our campaign, we, we started to distribute these uh, stickers to the shopkeepers that are members of our campaign. Uh, the sticker says, I pay who does not pay. So in the sense, of course, I support uh, those who uh, say no to the Mafia. Ha mai avuto problemi con estorsori? Naturalmente sì. Nella mia storia mh, passata ancora più gravi, l'ultimo è stato quando abbiamo aperto un negozio eh, con la storta in centro. L'indomani dell'inaugurazione abbiamo trovato l'attac nelle serra serrature. Invece che telefonarti e dire dammi i soldi, ti, ti mettono 
la attacca e poi ti chiamano e tu sei già ammorbidito secondo il messaggio mafioso e dunque come ha reagito a questo? ora allora, metto l'adesivo in tuo pizzo e questa è la risposta che devo dare it works like a sort of a beware to the dog sign you know so it says uh, uh, as soon as you will dare to uh, ask pizza here you will be immediately reported to the police and the consumers they know for sure just seeing this uh, sticker that in this shop uh, um, no, no, not a single cent uh, goes to the mafia e funziona? funziona funziona dunque non ha paura? No, assolutamente no il mafioso è vigliacco va dove trova persone deboli dove trova persone isolate quando vede un gruppo di persone che adesso ha Dio Pizzo ci pensa due volte prima di aggredirti o prima di venire a te 800 businesses have joined Adio Pizzo's anti-extortion campaign. In the huge task of eradicating the Mafia scourge, this is a small start, but the potential is revolutionary. Back in Calabria, the anti-Mafia fight is a generation behind. In fact, as the state focused on Sicily, the Andrangheta grew unchecked. While Cosa Nostra was committed to a strategy of terror, the Andrangheta made a completely different choice. They were not interested in a war against the state. They bought the state, piece by piece, they seeped into it. They didn't need to fight it. Andrangheta remained in the shadows, and in the shadows it grew in strength, power, potere, organizzazione e soprattutto ha accumulato ricchezze. The Calabrian mafia thrived on neglect, unknown to the world. Even most Italians struggled to pronounce its name. Until one night in 2007. On the 15th of August, a frantic call was received in a small village in Calabria. Pronto? A distraught caller asked for the Mama. Code name for a notorious Andrangheta boss. This dramatic call was not made from Calabria, not even from Italy. It came from a thousand miles away, from the German city of Duisburg. They'd likely never seen anything like this in Germany. At the scene, there were two cars, bodies splayed out, the acrid smell of cordite that we are so used to here, blood running on the street. This is a German street, clean, orderly. It's not the woods of Aspromonte. Six men were murdered that night. In the pocket of one of the victims, baffled German police found a mysterious charred image. Looking inside the pockets of those boys, they found an image of St. Michael the Archangel with the burnt hole in the center. That's what's used in the initiation ceremony for young Andrangheta members. That was the business card of the Andrangheta. The dead men were Calabrian gangsters investing their criminal profits in German hotels and restaurants. But their murders were the result of a bloody feud back in Calabria. For the world, it was like a slap in the face. What on earth is happening? Where do these people come from? Who are they? What is the Andrangheta? The killings stung the Italian state into action. Seasoned anti-mafia investigators were recruited to lead a crackdown. 
The Duisburg incident revealed how dangerous Andrangheta was, and that made the state realize even more that it needed to act strongly and decisively, and so it did. Within months, police rounded up the foot soldiers of the feuding clans. But a key boss remained at large, the ruthless, violent man nicknamed the Mama. When listening to the phone taps we heard reference to the Mama, we knew it was their code name for Antonio Pelli. That's what he was known as. But the hunt for Antonio Pelli was to demonstrate just what investigators were up against. In Calabria, fugitive bosses usually hide within their own communities, protected by a wall of silence. It was more than a year before a heavily armed squad swooped on a deserted warehouse, just outside Pele's hometown. Nothing suggested there might be a bunker or anything like that until we noticed something about part of the floor that made us suspicious. Suddenly we see this platform coming up from the floor. And then we hear the fugitive's voice from below. Antonio Pelle. Below the hydraulic lift, police found a fully furnished living space. The bunker was perfectly organized like a flat. It was one of the most sophisticated ever found in Calabria. He even had a greenhouse to grow cannabis, so his hobby too was taken care of. The capture of Antonio Pele was a major coup. But when, two years later, he mysteriously managed to escape from custody, it became clear just how fragile any victory against the Andrangheta can be. Scouring the mountainsides for fugitive bosses is important. But to really attack the Andrangheta, investigators needed to penetrate the deepest secrets of its structure. In 2009, they made a historic breakthrough. It came in a secluded valley at Polsi, home to one of the oldest shrines in Italy. The Madonna of Polsi, an object of religious veneration for centuries, a whole host of miracles have been attributed to this statue. Every year, a smaller wooden copy gets carried around the sanctuary here in procession, while women bellow ancient hymns and the crowd shouts, Viva Maria! This is one of the holiest places in southern Italy, but it's also a place with a very sinister history. Thousands of believers come to the shrine every summer. It was long suspected that mafiosi used the pilgrimage as cover, but for what? Then, in 2009, undercover agents spotted a very different kind of pilgrim. Just about here, on the 2nd of September 2009, 
that some of the top bosses in the Indrangheta were standing in a circle, as Indrangheta tradition dictates, having their secret meeting. Little did they know that the Carabinieri were filming them. The men spoke in a quasi-religious code. The scene we witnessed in Porsi harks back to ancient rituals and mysticism, but really it has little to do with religion and more to do with crime. Investigators had filmed a scene that surpassed Hollywood fiction, the highest body of the Indrangheta, in full session. This previously unknown ruling council had a name, Il Crimine, the crime. The Indrangheta was believed to be a family-based organization with lots of families, some more, some less organized, clashing with each other, making alliances. Instead, a new structure emerged, hierarchical and pyramid-like, similar to the Sicilian Mafia with a provincial executive deciding the criminal strategy, not only here in Reggio Calabria, but also in Italy, Europe, and around the world. What months of investigation revealed was a global mafia federation, with an annual turnover estimated at 44 billion euros. If accurate, that figure would be the equivalent of 3% of Italy's entire economic output. State offensive also revealed the extraordinary lengths that Andrangheta bosses will go to protect their power. To evade capture and continue to operate, they've built hundreds of bunkers. Many are ingeniously concealed beneath water tanks, behind radiators, wine racks or apparently solid walls. The elite unit known as the Cacciatori, or Hunters, were keen to show me one of their particular favorites. Adesso andiamo nella parte più interessante di tutta l'abitazione, che è questa piccola cantinetta, dove non si direbbe, ma è nascosto un bunker, un nascondiglio all'interno di questo forno. All'interno già abbiamo un segno distintivo, non è stato mai acceso. This has never cooked a single margarita in its life. And that was one of the clues that told the cacciatori that there was something fishy about this particular oven. A door inside the oven slides back on tracks revealing a 30-metre corridor dug deep into the hillside behind the house. Holy moly. This was once a rather nice bedroom suite, complete with mirrors, stereo, TV, bedroom furniture, heater. This was clearly a perfectly decent living space once upon a time. So we've come through the pizza oven, down the tunnel, through the bedroom, into the bathroom, and there's another secret entrance here leading who knows where. Here there are tunnels leading to bunkers, leading to more tunnels, leading to more bunkers. There's a kind of madness at work here.
the Andrangheta has also dug itself deep into Calabrian society. And to do that, it draws on more than just violence and intimidation. Bribery, corruption and political patronage have won some key players over to the Andrangheta's side. Unfortunately, the characteristic of the Andrangheta is that it's not only a criminal power, it also penetrates all layers of social and professional life. It's the collusion with politics, institutions and the business world. That's what strengthens the organization. Power to buy people, power to offer someone a job. Power to buy an official, a magistrate, a police officer. This is what money does. Calabria's institutions have been profoundly infiltrated. In 2012, the city council of Reggio Calabria was suspended by Italy's national government. The reason? Links to organized crime. The rise of the Pesce clan and its young boss Ciccio is a typical tale of Mafia power. Since we were kids, we've been taught that every man has his price. Ciccio Pesci was like the mayor. By 2010, investigators had amassed enough evidence to put Ciccio Pesci on trial and raided his hilltop mansion. Here too, they found a bunker, but of the boss himself, hardly any trace. It was evidence that the gangsters hold the real power in the region. If we don't catch a fugitive, it is because the state has failed. And people can't quite comprehend why some fugitives can be on the run for so long. Catching Ciccio Pesce became an absolute priority. A special carabinieri team began looking for a lead and for a bunker. They concentrated on what they knew Ciccio Pesce could not live without. Football and beautiful women. It was clearly difficult for him to bring a football pitch inside a bunker, but a woman would definitely have been easier. And so we concentrated on one woman in particular. This girl was different from all the others because she had a lifestyle that didn't match her means. So the boyfriend must have been rich, but we didn't see one. She took too much care of herself to be a single woman. We studied her habits. We began to follow her day and night. For months, surveillance was trained on Ciccio Pesce's suspected mistress, until one day, there was a breakthrough. A car turned up outside the woman's house. We recognized the driver. He was the armor of the Pesce clan, a man in contact with Ciccio Pesce. The investigators thought this man could be carrying messages between Pesce and his mistress. They tracked him to an isolated scrapyard a couple of miles outside Rosano. Surveillance was difficult in this area because there was no cover. It was impossible to go right up there and get a close look without being seen. This was a big problem for us. Faced with such difficulties on the ground, those hunting the Andrangheta bosses can now call on help from above. These observation windows are absolutely amazing. You can stick your head literally out of the fuselage of the aircraft and look straight down. The Italian government has invested millions in state-of-the-art spy planes like this one. In casa della gente, vedete le immagini molto definite, 
e considerate che stiamo viaggiando a circa 250 km orari, questo ci consente di essere completamente invisibili in un territorio controllato molto concretamente dall'andrangheta come questo, questo aereo si rivela uno strumento indispensabile per le nostre indagini, sembra di essere in questo posto, come vedi puoi vedere le persone, potete tranquillamente vedere se ci sono macchine, se la casa è abitata o è disabitata, potete vedere se i, il dettaglio dei comignoli, se c'è il riscaldamento che funziona. We're at something like 2,500 feet at the moment, and when they do these extraordinary zooms, they tell me that even from several kilometers away, they can identify the number plate on a car. Anche perché a differenza di un elicottero, l'aereo non, non si sente a terra e eh, anche guardando in cielo difficilmente ti viene in mente che un aereo possa stare proprio eh, a filmare te. Investigators were trawling through all conceivable evidence about the scrapyard suspected of being Pesce's lair. And so we began to get hold of satellite images of the previous two-year period. We were looking to identify structural changes made to the area. And then we got lucky. The presence of a bulldozer, wooden boards to spread mortar, heaps of cement mix, sand, the cement mixer. The photos showed that six months earlier, Builders had been at work, but there was no evidence of any new buildings, at least not above ground. Questa è la strada che abbiamo percorso il pomeriggio del 9 agosto del 2011, la sera in cui abbiamo catturato Ciccio Pesce. Siamo arrivati da quella stradina con il nostro convoglio di macchina. Appena arrivati qui. Una parte dei, dei miei uomini si sono portati su questo fronte e hanno cinturato tutto questo padiglione per essere certi che nessuno potesse uscire. E abbiamo voluto abbattere questo cancello. L'abbiamo abbattuto con una mazza proprio qui. Avevamo un grosso vantaggio che era l'effetto sorpresa. In fact, as the carabinieri entered and searched every inch of the compound, secret cameras were trained on them. The owner of the compound finally appeared and reluctantly led Lumiere and his men to a chicken coop. Senza problemi. Ma veniste tutti? Questo posto. E ci ricarbrea, le chiamate. Dopo qualche istante A few moments later, the trap door opened. No, 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 no. Esce ed è bianco. He comes out and he's white, like a corpse. He's lost 15 kilos, but we had recognized his voice when he'd shouted from the tomb in which he'd buried himself for months. We'd got him. The hunt for one of Italy's most dangerous men was over. Io non prendo un premio se faccio del male a qualcuno di voi, dovete figliare la casa pure voi. Noi non dobbiamo portare onesti e voi così lo so. Io so che voi ci dai Cala! The bunker had been Pesce's command center for months. Through a dozen CCTV cameras, he watched his hunters closing in. That gave him just enough time to destroy any incriminating evidence. Pesce has begun a 20-year prison sentence. Now the Italian state is putting 64 alleged members of his clan on trial. Ironically, they are being tried in a so-called bunker courtroom, bomb-proof and several meters underground. Di materiale probatorio. 
perché il tribunale con questo processo processa l'andrangheta. This is one of the first major trials against the andrangheta since its secret structure was revealed. The state is trying to show that it can fight the mafia and win. The stakes are high and not only for Italy. Andrangheta clones its own criminal structure, multiplies it and plants itself in new territories. In Canada, Australia, Switzerland, Germany. There is no bit of territory, no social category which is immune from the possibility of contagion by the Andrangheta, by the Mafia. There isn't any. But even the vast resources being poured into the fight against the Andrangheta can only begin to tackle the problem. We can arrest 100, 200, 300, but there will always be offspring ready to take the reins of the clan. Until Calabrian society stops shaking the hand of the mafioso, pretending not to know he is a mafioso, until that happens, there's no chance of uprooting the weed. The battle in Calabria is still tough. It's still difficult. In Sicily, it took years of fighting to get results. Public opinion, the people must be reassured that the state is strong, credible and in charge. In Calabria, the road is still long. It's more than ten years since businessman Gaetano Safioti took his brave stand and defied the Andrangheta. He is still a pariah and a prisoner in his own community. Here, we are in a kind of bunker. It's the price you have to pay. I pay this willingly for what I set out to achieve. But only when there are many of us, then I'll be able to call myself completely free. Free to walk around like everyone else, to go for a ride on my bike, to go to the beach, to watch the sea and swim. All these things that normal people do, but I'm prevented from doing. Sooner or later, it will happen. We need more time, but it will happen. I'm sure of it. What I've seen in Calabria are scenes from a war, a war that the rest of the world doesn't even know is going on. The tragedy of this land is that it took so long for the Italian state to begin a serious fight back. But having seen what I've seen on this journey, I have a hope, a belief, that the tide of history has finally begun to turn.